Our final stop on our journey through the medieval world is an empire which had endured since antiquity. The Eastern Roman Empire began as the eastern division of the ancient Roman Empire. When Rome fell in the mid-400s, the Eastern Empire, centered on Constantinople, continued on for another thousand years, with numerous periods of prosperity. The inhabitants of the empire itself, though they still considered themselves Roman, thought Constantinople to be the capital of the world and the holiest city of the Christian kingdoms. During the early 500s, the empire would reach new heights under the Justinian dynasty. It was founded in 518 by Justin I, but it was the next emperor, his nephew Justinian, that had visions of past grandeur. His dream was a Renoatio Imperii Romanorum, a project to restore the Roman Empire. Under Justinian's general, Belisarius, one of the all-time greatest, an invasion was launched west. The first targets were the Vandals. After the Germanic band sacking of Rome, they continued their migrations and settled in North Africa forming a kingdom. Though they outnumbered the Eastern Roman armies, they became complacent and didn't take advantage of a decisive opportunity, which instead let Belisarius choose the time and place of attack and the Vandals were routed. By 534, the Vandal Kingdom fell to the Eastern Romans, and the first phase of the project was complete. After being recalled home, Belisarius then sailed to Sicily and the Italian peninsula in 535, which at this time was occupied by the Ostrogothic Kingdom, which we mentioned last episode. This was the start of the Gothic War, which would last almost two decades. The Ostrogoths were in the midst of internal political rifts, so Belisarius faced little resistance on his march towards Rome. He was invited in by the Pope, but when the Ostrogothic king, Vitiges, heard this, he sent perhaps one of the largest armies ever assembled to besiege Rome. It lasted for over a year, but to no avail. His failure in the siege reflected his own failures as king. Belisarius had fortified too well, and the siege was broken. In the end, after many sieges and more bloodshed than Italy could bear, Belisarius marched into the Ostrogoth capital of Ravenna, and deposed Vitiges. But the Ostrogoths proved more resilient than expected. Their new king, Totila, forced a counterattack and managed to reconquer most of the Italian peninsula by 552. So Justinian sent in his other great general, an Armenian named Narses, to advance into Italy from the north, with a coalition of troops, including the Lombards. Totila was killed soon after in battle, and by 554, the Ostrogothic kingdom was no more, and the Gothic War had ended. Rome was fittingly back in the empire. Before long, they conquered southern Spain from the Visigoths, and the empire would start to look as it did under the ancient Romans, a true Mediterranean power. Justinian is also credited with a profound influence on Western culture, from his codification of Roman law. The Eastern Empire had access to many legal and political documents from earlier centuries, which Justinian became very familiar with. He hired a jurist, Trebonian, to collect and compile these into a set of edicts, called the Corpus Juris Civilis, or Body of Civil Law. The Corpus Juris Civilis consists of four main parts. The Codex Justinianus, or Code of Justinian, was the first part, published in 529. It contained imperial enactments and laws from the time of ancient Rome to Justinian's reign. The Digest, also called the Pandects, was completed in 533. It was a compilation of jurists' writings and opinions on Roman law. The Institutiones, or Institutes, were also published in 533, provided an introductory textbook on Roman law for students, and was used for centuries after Justinian's death. The Noelare Constitutiones, or Novels, were a collection of new laws enacted by Justinian after the publication of the first three parts of the Corpus Juris Civilis. They were later added to the collection after his death to complete the compilation. The corpus played a significant role in preserving and transmitting Roman legal principles and concepts, and it became the foundation of civil law systems in continental Europe. 
It was the last official work from the Eastern Empire produced in Latin, as Greek soon became favored once again. Though his reign is considered to be one of the Eastern Empire's golden ages, this isn't to say Justinian didn't face any hardships. His first was of a personal nature. Before he was emperor, he became smitten by a young lady named Theodora. She was the daughter of the keeper of bears for the games at Constantinople. When her father died, Theodora followed in her mother's footsteps and became an actress, a profession that was associated with prostitution. It wasn't until Emperor Justin changed the laws that his nephew Justinian was able to marry Theodora. When Justinian became emperor in 527, Theodora became his empress, helping to establish churches and monasteries, including a convent for former prostitutes. Soon after, in 532, Justinian and Theodora had to deal with the Nika riots. Nika was the cry that could be heard from the Hippodrome during chariot races, as rival factions urged their teams to victory. This was a titanic amphitheater, capable of holding more than 60,000 spectators. The two main charioteer factions were the Blues and the Greens, and like modern-day sports rivalries, could often get out of hand and even become political. When a member of the Blues and a member of the Greens were arrested for murder and sentenced to execution, both escaped and fled to a church. At the chariot games, with Justinian in attendance, the supporters of the two fugitives banded together, demanding their exoneration, directing their angry and vitriolic chants at the emperor. The crowd soon grew overwhelming, and the games were cancelled. Mobs of people vomited out of the Hippodrome and went on a mad campaign of destruction for the next five days. The royal palace was besieged and the city was in flames. The Hagia Sophia, the city's most prominent church was burned. The mobs chose for themselves a new emperor, and Justinian was ready to flee the capital, but Theodora convinced her husband to stay and fight, and that if they were to meet death, it was a better sentence than living as a fugitive. One of Justinian's loyal generals, Narses, bribed some of the mob and stoked the internal divisions between the Greens and Blues, while Belisarius fled the city to amass the troops needed to crush the revolt. After the devastating riots, Justinian rebuilt the city bigger and better than ever, and it remained the largest city in Europe during the medieval period. He built roads, bridges, public baths, schools, monasteries, hospitals, and especially churches. In the capital alone, he built a stunning 34 of these, one of which was a rebuilt version of that which burned during the Nika revolts. This was the Church of the Holy Wisdom, or Hagia Sophia. Justinian commissioned two Greek scientists, Anthemius of Tralles and Isidore of Miletus to design it, and five years later, the project was complete. This Hagia Sophia was much larger than the previous, and instead of the traditional flat-roofed feature on basilicas, this was capped by a large dome filled with mosaics. It would remain the largest piece of Christian architecture for almost 1,000 years. Along with the Royal Palace and Hippodrome, the Hagia Sophia became one of the most magnificent buildings in the city. But Justinian's next hardship came in 542. He was struck down by plague, the same bacterium responsible for the devastating Black Death which would hit Eurasia in the late Middle Ages. Justinian survived his fight with the disease, but this sickness, later called the Plague of Justinian, killed around one in five people in Constantinople. It was first reported in Roman Egypt a year prior, and ended up spreading throughout the Mediterranean Basin and Arabian Peninsula. Though Justinian recovered, the disease had devastating effects on the social and economic systems of the Eastern Empire. The plague, along with the expansion campaigns, left the empire weak, vulnerable, and with dwindling coffers. Theodora died in 548, but Justinian survived her for almost another two decades. Belisarius died in 565, and Justinian just eight months later. It was to be the end of an era. The declining state of the empire couldn't be saved by Justinian's ineffectual successors. Soon after his death, the Lombards, another Germanic group, entered Italy, setting up their own kingdom under Alboin. 
the Eastern Romans weren't expelled, but kept territory called the Exarchate of Ravenna, which would bring them into constant conflict with the new arrivals. The Visigoths, the Germanic people to the west, recovered Spain by the early 600s. Justinian's vision of a renewed Roman Empire seemingly died with him. It was a turning point, and soon it was the Eastern Romans who would face external threats with Sassanid Persia in the east, the Avars along the Danube, and Slavic invasions. The Justinian dynasty continued under three more emperors before a successful army revolt in 602, which saw the last Justinian emperor, Maurice, murdered along with his sons. The leader of the revolt was Phocas, an officer in the military, who was then proclaimed emperor. He ruled with little success and destabilized the empire even further. He was deemed a usurper, and in 610, was overthrown and executed by Heraclius, son of the Exarch of Africa. This established the Heraclian dynasty, which would rule the empire for over 100 years. During the reign of Heraclius, the empire was under constant threat from the Persians to the east, and the Slavs to the north. By the mid-600s, they had to implement a new system of defense, called the Theme System. This replaced the earlier provincial system set up by Diocletian and Constantine, and was meant to combine both civilian and military offices. Continuing a legacy dating back to the Greeks and Persians, the ancient Romans and Parthians would engage in constant warfare since the days of the Republic. This continued under the Roman Empire, with the Parthian successors, the Sassanids, who grew to be the most powerful of the Iranian empires. Though the Western Empire went into decline, the Eastern Romans and Sassanids continued their stalemate for another two centuries. They were the two most powerful military entities in Eurasia by that point. Though Heraclius was initially successful in recapturing Eastern territories from the Sassanids, it just exhausted both empires' resources. This paved the way for another contender, one which would come to threaten the Eastern Empire even more than the Sassanids. This came from a coalition of newly unified societies from the Arabian Peninsula. For more information on the Arab expansion, you can check out this previous episode. Under the Rashidun and Umayyad caliphs, the Arabs launched a swift invasion into the Near East, defeating the Eastern Romans in 636 at the Battle of the Yarmouk, near the Yarmouk River. Though the Romans lost their grain-producing territories in Egypt and their rich tax revenues from the Levant, they were more fortunate than the Sassanid Empire, which collapsed to the Arab armies. In 674, they then moved on to besiege Constantinople itself. The capital of the empire was one of the most well-defended cities of the ancient world, and its impenetrable walls kept the city safe from siege since its founding. Knowing of the city's fabled fortifications, the Arabs instead set up a naval blockade and attacked seasonally until 678. Though their armies came prepared, they could not prepare for one of the empire's secret weapons. As the Arab ships approached, their wooden hulls would burst into flames. The Eastern Roman armies rained down liquid hell on their foes, and used tubes to throw underwater flames onto the enemy. This was a weapon called Greek fire, a compound most likely containing naphtha, quicklime or sulfur. They developed pressurized nozzles to shoot this fire like a flamethrower, and even used it to create incendiary grenades. It remained a closely guarded state secret, but did its job in breaking the siege. There was another siege in 717 to 718, but the results were the same. Again, with the use of Greek fire, the Eastern Romans fended off the attack, resulting in more permanent borders being drawn just south of Anatolia. It was a tough century for the Empire, as they had lost their holdings in the Near East, as well as in North Africa. To the north, the Heraclians faced another invasion. This was from a group of Turkic seminomadic warriors called the Bulgars. We mentioned them in our double-length overview of the Middle Ages, so be sure to check it out. The Bulgars had arrived by the 500s, and in the late 600s, the Bulgars and South Slavs defeated the Eastern Roman armies, setting up the Bulgarian Empire in the Balkans. This created further losses for the Eastern Roman Empire, 
and by the early 700s, the days of Roman glory seemed over. Though the empire was much smaller by the end of the dynasty than the start, the theme system helped them retain their core in Greece and Anatolia. But the Eastern Empire went from a contender to restore the old Roman Empire, to barely holding onto its own survival. Some refer to this next period, as the Dark Ages. After a transition that took centuries, the empire was left with a different and more unique culture which historians have called Byzantine or Byzantine. The term, Byzantine, was a more recent fabrication, derived from the original name for Constantinople, Byzantium, which was founded as a Greek colony by the legendary Byzas, a thousand years earlier. Latin declined, and Greek became both the common and official language of the Byzantine Empire. As a deeply Christian empire, much of Byzantine art was steered towards religious endeavors, like the construction of churches, and the statues and mosaics that were to inhabit them. The mix of extreme piety and extreme reverence for their art, actually became a point of contention so stark, that it caused widespread political instability. Religious images and icons had become commonplace, but some viewed this as a form of idolatry, the worship of idols, an act strictly forbidden in the church, and one of the most important rules for Christians to follow. By 695, a representation of Jesus was even placed on the backs of newly minted coins. Those who defended the religious images, claimed they were meant as a means of further visual understanding for those who were illiterate. After the Heraclians were deposed in a period of anarchy, the Isaurian dynasty took power in 717, under Leo III. During his reign, he attempted to purify the Christian faith from what he believed was an adoration and worship of icons, especially from Christian monks. In what has become known as the first Byzantine iconoclasm, Leo outlawed the use of icons, causing internal divisions with long-lasting consequences. There was widespread destruction of religious images, and those who were viewed as venerating any icons were persecuted. While the poor, and those living in Anatolia closer to the Arab border, weren't primarily affected, the wealthier citizens of Constantinople, and those living in the Byzantine provinces in southern Italy strongly opposed it. The popes in Rome also strongly condemned the move, creating more of a rift between the East and West that would culminate in the 11th century. Though the edict was reversed 70 years later in 787, the iconoclasm controversy fueled future political divisions and instability within the empire. Under the Isaurian dynasty, the Byzantines lost the Exarchate of Ravenna to the Lombards, and then the Franks, who gave the land to the papacy, to form the Papal States. The Byzantines reorganized their provinces that remained in the south of the peninsula and on Sicily but these would be fought over by the Lombards and Arabs. From the 500s to 700s, during the reigns of the Justinian to the Isaurian emperors, the Byzantines viewed themselves as legitimate inheritors of the Christian Roman tradition. Emperors were deemed divinely chosen to rule, and subjects were to show them utmost reverence. The emperor was responsible for daily rituals, which are described in the Book of Ceremonies outlining the imperial ceremonial protocol at the Byzantine court. Each morning, the royal palace was opened with a processional march. Special ceremonies were also added for promotions, birthdays, and marriages. Unlike the kingdoms in the west, the Byzantine Empire stayed relatively centralized, with the power of the emperor absolute. The nobles and aristocrats were part of the clergy or civil servants, all closely linked to the emperor. The emperor and his government maintained the economy, by regulating agricultural and manufacturing industries, and controlling commerce with a monopoly on the grain and silk trades. This hands-on approach began during the ancient period, as foreign threats brought more need for centralization. This also meant the Byzantines were quite familiar with war and the military. Though a defensive culture first and foremost, they kept their armies armed with the latest weaponry in one hand, and the latest military literature in the other, emphasizing the art of diplomacy. Some of their methods became quite cunning and overly complex, giving us the modern term of Byzantine. But though their stealthy and devious methods led to victories outside the empire, these same palace politics threatened it from within. 
Despite Western Europe inheriting much of the old Roman Empire and kept many of their institutions, it was the Byzantines who truly held the essence of the imperial state. Not only did they act as a buffer state to the encroaching Islamic armies to the east, but Justinian's codification of the Roman law eventually became widely studied in Western Europe, and became the basis for numerous European legal systems. As the empire included Greek lands, many ancient Greek classical works were also preserved and studied. Most of their literature was focused on legal or military affairs, but as the Byzantines were devoutly religious, they wrote plenty of religious essays and biographies of saints. Procopius was the court historian during the reign of Justinian in the 500s, and accompanied Belisarius during his campaigns abroad. His History of the Wars is our main source for the Byzantine Wars with the Persians in the east, and reconquest of the Mediterranean in the west, both the Vandalic War against the Vandals in North Africa, and the Gothic War, with the Ostrogoths in Italy. He modeled his works after Thucydides, the famous ancient Greek historian who is our main source for the Peloponnesian War. Both works even mention calamitous plagues which devastated their cities. Procopius, dealing with the Justinian plague, and Thucydides with the plague of Athens, which hit a cramped Athens a thousand years prior. It's a story you can find in our last mega-documentary. Apart from fostering an intellectual and legal culture, and as a military buffer zone, the Byzantines acted as gateway to the east for Western Europe, as they were the center of trade between the two continents. Though Italy and the Low Countries became trading hubs, products from the east first passed through Constantinople, before sailing across the Mediterranean with the Italian merchants. Traders came to the capital from Egypt, Babylon, the Ruslands, Persia, Italy, and more, making it a wealthy trading hub. Europeans continued their obsession with eastern silks, spices, and jewelry. The Byzantines also had a market that dealt in the buying and selling of humans. These prisoners were often from Slavic communities, giving us the word which has become slave. Though China had had the monopoly on the silk trade, two Christian monks, with the aid of Emperor Justinian, smuggled silkworms from Asia and brought them to the West. This ended China's dominance in the silk market, and the Byzantine Empire began to produce it at workshops in the royal palace itself, and grew fabulously wealthy trading it with the rest of Europe. After the iconoclasm controversy, during the 700s, the Byzantines endured under the Isaurians during a time of decline. Most distressing was the appointment of Charlemagne in year 800, as Emperor of the Romans, and the founding of the Carolingian Empire, the seeming successor to the imperial title of ancient Rome. This didn't sit well with the Byzantines, who viewed themselves as inheritors of the Roman tradition, and still viewed the Germanic societies in the West as utterly barbaric. Iconoclasm returned in 813, and it brought with it further division with the West, and the expansion of systems resembling feudalism, threatening the centralized state. But Empress Theodora, regent of Michael III, of the subsequent Amorian dynasty, finally banned iconoclasm for good in 843. Soon after though, another schism polarized the East and West. This was called the Photian Schism, occurring during the mid-800s. It revolved around the controversial appointment of Photios, as the Patriarch of Constantinople, bypassing the regular ecclesiastical hierarchy. He had no clerical background, and was more suited to be a scholar or statesman, than part of the clergy, let alone the highest church position in the empire. The schism involved religious disputes, jurisdictional conflicts, and political power struggles. It was eventually resolved in 879 with the Fourth Council of Constantinople, which affirmed Photios as the legitimate patriarch and reconciled relations between the Pope in Rome and Patriarch of Constantinople. It was Photios who commissioned brothers Cyril and Methodius to the Slavs in Moravia, and is a central figure in the conversion missions to both the Slavs and Bulgars. Contemporary historians viewed Emperor Michael as the last in a long line of incompetent leaders, and he was even known as Michael the Drunkard. Despite this, his reign brought in a new era of intellectualism, 
and contributed to a period of high culture during the next dynasty. Keeping in line with his uninformed nature, Michael befriended a poor Macedonian peasant named Basil, who came to impress the emperor with his wrestling abilities. Now in the inner circle, Basil married the emperor's mistress, and began sowing division within the court, murdering Bardas, Michael's uncle and de facto ruler. Soon after, Basil had Michael killed as well. Both his hands were chopped off before he was stabbed through the heart. Basil then took the throne in 867, and so began the Macedonian dynasty. After the slow decline that followed the Justinians, sometimes called the Byzantine Dark Ages, it was time for another golden era. It was time for a renaissance. Once the Macedonian dynasty took power, they stabilized their borders against invaders, and mended diplomatic affairs with the Western Church. Coming from humble beginnings, these emperors were more populist, strengthening the standing of free farmers who were losing land to wealthy aristocrats, and oversaw a golden age for both culture and imperial power, called the Macedonian Renaissance. It was mostly exemplified through emperors Leo VI and Constantine VII, who left a mark on Byzantine history through their administrative reforms, literary contributions, and attempts to strengthen the empire internally and externally. The Macedonian Renaissance witnessed a revival of interest in classical Greek literature, philosophy, and science. Byzantine scholars and intellectuals focused on studying and preserving ancient Greek texts, leading to a rediscovery of ancient knowledge, well before Western Europe, and a renewed appreciation for classical works. The Macedonian emperors, particularly Basil I and his successors, supported and patronized the arts, sciences, and education. They established centers of learning, such as the renowned University of Constantinople, where scholars gathered to study and exchange ideas. Emperors and the wealthy elite sponsored the creation of manuscripts, the construction of magnificent churches and palaces, and the commissioning of artwork, promoting a vibrant cultural scene. The period saw remarkable achievements in Byzantine art and architecture. Artists and architects developed innovative techniques, revitalizing classical motifs and incorporating new elements. Iconography flourished, and the Byzantine church commissioned elaborate mosaics, frescoes, and iconography for churches and monasteries. Foreign dignitaries would be utterly stunned by the empire's throne room, which featured golden birds that sang from golden trees, and golden lions which thumped their tails and roared. The throne itself could rest on the ground one minute and rise into the air the next. It was also during this dynasty that the Byzantine church christenized the Eastern Slavs and the Kievan Rus, one of its most long-lasting accomplishments. During the 900s, the empire was flourishing once again. After its more cultured and scholarly phase, it was time for more offensive military campaigns. These began early in the century, and culminated with the most successful military emperor of them all. His name was Basil II. He conquered the old Bulgarian Empire, and annexed their land, creating the theme of Bulgaria. According to legend, out of 15,000 Bulgarian prisoners, he had 99 out of every 100 soldiers blinded, while the last one was allowed to keep a single eye, to allow them to lead their armies home. When Samuel, the emperor of the Bulgarians, saw what was left of his once unstoppable army, he reportedly had a heart attack, and died. With the help of previous emperors, Basil, commonly known as the Bulgar Slayer, controlled an empire from southern Italy in the west, to Armenia and Syria in the east, with full control of Cyprus and Crete in the Adriatic. The empire was in full revival, and by the time of Basil's death in 1025, it was as large as it had ever been since the times of Justinian. Although the empire under the Macedonians was still much smaller than under Justinian, Culture was constantly being exported throughout its territories, making it more of an integrated Byzantine state than Justinian's overextended empire. Soon after Basil's death, the empire went into decline. As his successors didn't wield the same centralized control, aristocrats and military generals began forming alliances with wealthy landowners, at the expense of the peasant classes. 
This shift made the upper classes more powerful, but as the Byzantine armies relied on peasant soldiers, there were less recruits, and less manpower. To amend this, generals recruited mercenaries instead. One of their most famous mercenary units began as a group of Vikings and wielded the Danish battle axe, by this point feared throughout Europe. 6,000 warriors were initially sent to Basel by Vladimir, Prince of Kiev, in order to fend off a rebellion. These invaluable units became known as the Varangian Guard, or Men of the Pledge, and managed to secure a place as Basil's personal bodyguards, similar to the Praetorian Guard in ancient Rome. One Viking mercenary, Harald Sigurdsson, was exiled from Norway, and spent 15 years working for the Kievan Rus and eventually as a chief in the Varangian Guard. He later returned to Norway and became king in 1046, leading to his epithet of Harald the Hard Ruler, or Harald Hardrada, the same who fought the last Anglo-Saxon king for the throne of England in 1066. Harald's death at Stamford Bridge has been seen by some historians as the final breath of the tumultuous Viking Age. The growing rift between the Eastern and Western churches came to a head in 1054. The Patriarch of Constantinople refused the assertion that the papacy of Rome was the head of the entire Christian church. Pope Leo IX and Patriarch Michael Cerulianus then excommunicated each other creating a schism between the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches, a schism that had been brewing for centuries. Both are Chalcedonian forms of the faith, and have the most adherents worldwide, but non-Chalcedonian denominations split earlier, like the Oriental Orthodox Church, consisting of some of the most ancient denominations, like the Coptic, Armenian, and Ethiopian churches. Though there weren't many effects at the time, it seemingly marked an end to the Byzantine days of glory. Though Western Europe was also Christian, they grew to be as much of a threat as those to the East. In the East, highly organized Turkic migrations occurred. The most ambitious of these were nomadic armies from Central Asia, a group called the Seljuk Turks. They swept west, capturing Baghdad in 1055, and then moved into Anatolia, the domain of the Byzantine Empire. By this time, the Macedonian dynasty had ended, and the new Ducas dynasty was full of betrayal and palace intrigue. What happened next then, was no surprise. The new emperor, Romanos IV, led his armies out to stop the Seljuk encroachment in Anatolia, and met them, at what would be called the Battle of Manzikert. But this was less of a fight and more of a fiasco. Half of the Byzantine army deserted, and the emperor was defeated and taken prisoner. It marked only the second time in Roman history that the emperor was taken prisoner by a foreign army. The first was Emperor Valerian, who was captured by the Persians at the Battle of Edessa in 260. With this defeat, most of Anatolia was lost, and Turkic migrants settled there, forming their own state in 1077. The Bulgars and Serbs also made gains in the Balkans, and the Normans ended all Byzantine rule in Italy for good. It took decades for order to be restored in the court, as the new emperor, Alexius I, of the Komnenos dynasty, attempted to restore and revitalize his faltering state. He made reforms in the military, and turned the disorganized Byzantine army into a new force called the Komnenian army. To stabilize his borders, Alexios asked the Western powers for aid against the Turks. He was hoping for soldiers to help him fend off the Seljuks, but what he got instead was the Crusades, a campaign to take back the Holy Land. To reach the Levant, the heavily armed Crusaders would have to march through Byzantine territory. This terrified the Emperor, as the Crusaders might turn and attempt to depose him. So Alexios asked them for an oath of loyalty, and made them promise that any lands they conquered in the east would become territories of the Byzantine Empire. But after their successful campaign, they set up their own crusader states, leaving the Byzantines with yet another nearby threat. Alexios is credited for beginning what is known as the Komnenian Restoration, the military, financial, and territorial recovery of the empire. Alexios stopped the Turks in the east, and had successful campaigns in the Balkans against the Bulgars and Serbs, while keeping invading Normans at bay. 
the 1100 saw more exchange with Western Europe. During the reign of Manuel, tens of thousands of foreign mercenaries, Venetians, and other Italian traders took up residence in Constantinople. But there was still a brewing resentment between the Western Europeans, who were perhaps jealous and resentful of the opulence of the city, while the Byzantines saw the Western Europeans as unsophisticated and ill-tempered. After the Venetians attacked the Genoese, their merchant rivals in the city, Manuel arrested and expelled the Venetians in 1171, seizing their ships and property, pitting Venice and the empire against one another. Despite this, with parts of Anatolia and most of the Balkans reconquered, the empire was once again the most powerful state in the Mediterranean. Once Manuel died, his estranged cousin marched on Constantinople, deposing the new infant emperor and his unpopular empress regent, and became Emperor Andronikos I. What followed was the massacre of tens of thousands of Latins living in the city, including Genoese and Pisan merchants from Italy. The few that survived either fled or were sold into slavery. Though the Komnenos dynasty showed favor to the aristocratic classes, Andronikos wished to exterminate it, leading to several revolts. One family, the Angelos, were involved in one of these failed uprisings. Isaac Angelos was to be arrested by the foremost noble in Andronico's court. But instead of arresting Isaac, he was killed by him. After taking refuge at the Hagia Sophia, Isaac appealed to the people and started even greater riots. When Andronico's came back to his city, he found the people had crowned Isaac as new emperor. Andronikos attempted to flee, but was captured. From there, he spent three days in the stuff of nightmares. He had his right hand cut off, one of his eyes gouged out, boiling water thrown on his face, and his teeth and hair forcibly removed. He was the last emperor from the male line of the Komnenoi dynasty. Though the Angelos were now in power under Isaac, things wouldn't look any better. Once Saladin died after the Third Crusade, Pope Innocent took advantage and set the Fourth Crusade into motion. To reach the Holy Land, the Venetians were to grant the Crusaders safe passage over the seas. The price of travel far exceeded what the Crusaders were willing to pay though, so the Venetian captains cut them a deal. They were to help them recapture the important port city of Zara, on the Adriatic coast, part of the Kingdom of Hungary. After the successful siege and sacking of the city, they spent the winter of 1202 there. Meanwhile, in Constantinople, Isaac and his son Alexios IV were deposed and placed in prison. But Alexios escaped and pleaded with the Crusaders for aid in regaining the crown. In exchange, they would receive silver and troops to aid them on their mission to the Holy Land. The deal was struck, and the Crusaders sailed to Constantinople, restoring Isaac as emperor, with Alexius IV becoming his co-emperor. It was soon clear, however, that the Byzantines couldn't possibly pay the exorbitant amount promised to the Western armies. Relations deteriorated, and in 1204, they stormed the city, looting and stealing all the valuables that remained. Clergymen who accompanied the Crusaders took as many religious artifacts and relics as they could find. The empire could have ceased to exist at this point, as the Angelos dynasty was officially deposed. The Crusaders made it their own state, the Latin Empire, with Count Baldwin of Flanders as emperor. The Venetians benefited as well, as they acquired Crete, and secured for themselves the main trade route from Constantinople, to Italy and the rest of Europe. Sentiment in the West at the time was that the church was unified once again, two centuries after the Great Schism. But instead of thriving, the Latins only adopted the same problems the Byzantines had been dealing with. The Bulgarian attacks continued from the north, and fighting erupted internally. Furthermore, the empire was now surrounded by three Byzantine successor states, the Despotate of Epirus, the Empire of Trebizond, and the Empire of Nicaea. In 1259, Michael Paleologus, a Greek military leader, took power in Nicaea, and marched on Constantinople. By 1261, he had reconquered the city from the Latins, and became the first emperor of the Paleologos dynasty. 
they would rule for two centuries and be the last Byzantine dynasty. Though the empire was restored, it was a shell of its previous glory, and consisted of only a small portion of Anatolia and Greece. This would only continue to shrink. The loss of territory made them vulnerable from all sides. To the north, the Bulgarians had formed a second empire amid the turmoil at the end of the Komnenos dynasty in 1185, and the Venetians and remnants of the Latin Empire proved they couldn't be trusted. To the east were the Turks in Anatolia, who by this point had become vassals of the Mongols. Soon, numerous smaller principalities, or Beyliks, emerged. One of these, under Osman I, passively declared their independence by minting coins with their own king's face. The transliteration of Osman came to be known as Ottoman. Though they weren't the most powerful Beylik at the start, they spread quickly throughout the 1300s, taking both Turkic and Byzantine territory. Instead of countless attacks on Constantinople, they head into the Balkans, defeating the Bulgarians and moved towards Serbia where they met them in 1389 at the Battle of Kosovo. Though the Serbians had far fewer numbers, it is said a Serbian knight, Miloš Obilić, killed Sultan Murad, stopping the advance. Both sides suffered heavily though, and the Ottomans were able to raise another army quickly, and annex Serbia. By the 1400s, the Byzantine Empire was little more than the city of Constantinople, and was surrounded on all sides by the Ottomans. In 1451, the Ottomans had a new sultan, not even 20 years old. His name was Mehmed II. Two years later, in 1453, Mehmed and his army of at least 80,000 approached the walls of Constantinople. The famous walls had been state-of-the-art fortifications for 1,000 years, first with the walls built by Constantine in the 300s, and then the double line of Theodosian walls built during the 400s. Inside the city, Emperor Constantine XI, of the Paleologos dynasty, cobbled together a force of just 10,000 soldiers, while 30,000 armed civilians awaited the enemy. The walls had been impregnable, but Mehmed had a secret weapon. A year earlier, in 1252, a Hungarian engineer with a mysterious past, named Orban, approached Emperor Constantine to sell him his services, but the emperor couldn't pay. Orban then approached the Turks, claiming he had a weapon that could blast the walls of Babylon itself. He was hired and built Mehmed a gigantic cannon called Basilic or the Basilica. Its barrel was between 24 to 26 feet long and it was capable of firing cannonballs of 1200 pounds, well over 500 kilograms. Basilic was so heavy, it needed to be pulled to the battle by 60 oxen and over 400 men. The only drawback was that it could only be used a few times per day because of reload and cooling times. Mehmed had other smaller cannons and bombards, but Basilic was one of a kind. In early April, the terrifying first shot was fired. With many times more men, and a fleet surrounding the city to the north, all that stood between the Ottomans and victory, were the Great Walls of Constantinople. Fifty-three days later, the walls were finally breached, and the Ottoman army charged for a final assault and swarmed the city. The brave Emperor Constantine was said to have immediately charged at the incoming army, and was the first to perish. The rest of the city soon fell, and there was a period of looting and other atrocities, where churches were burned and families separated. Many Byzantine soldiers were killed and thousands of inhabitants sold into slavery. Mehmed then marched into the city, rode to the Hagia Sophia, and ordered it to be converted into a mosque. This was to be the new capital of the Ottoman Empire. And the Byzantines, the Eastern Roman Empire, successors to the empire founded 1,500 years earlier, collapsed. Orban's fate remains a mystery, but it's believed the engineer was killed during the siege, when one of his own cannons exploded. Since the fall of the Western Empire, Constantinople had been besieged over 20 times, and was only penetrated twice. Once was by the Crusaders in 1204. The other was May 29, 1453. 
The remaining smaller Greek states were conquered by the early 1460s, and the Roman Empire's political era was finally laid to rest. Its legacy would continue to live on though, through other civilizations. For many, this is a story of great joy, for others, great sadness. For everyone, it remains history. The medieval age had finally come to an end, and it was gunpowder that killed it. But it did make the next age a lot more interesting. <laughs>